Okay, there's, there's a place uh, called the center of mass uh, that extended objects have. Um, and so that's what we're going to talk about today. You know, and what is the center of mass? Now, proving, um, proving the equation for this uh, is going to come a little bit later when we talk about torque. We haven't talked about torque yet. So I think we're just going to kind of give an intuitive explanation for what the center of mass is. Um, and then uh, when I'm done recording this, I'll, I'll show you some uh, demonstrations, you know, that I can't use the document camera for. But in any case, <coughs> the center of mass, well, um, it's, it's the location in space where you, can, it, where you can act as if all the mass of an object is concentrated there. Um, and uh, so, for example, let's say I've got a, um, a, a, like a planet or a particle or something like that. We'll call this M1. And then we'll extend out here to M2. And we want to know where is the center of, of mass here. Well, intuitively, look, I made M2 a little bit bigger. So imagine a place where if I had a, like a, a rod that connects these two things, that, and where that rod had no mass itself. It was a, OK, it's, so it's kind of an imaginary thing. Where would this, ba you know, where would this balance? If I was to put this on my pencil right here, where would this thing balance if I would, were to release it? A little bit closer to the heavier mass, right? You know this. And it's just kind of intuitive. And so we have a symbol for where that location in space is, where these two things would balance if you were to uh, balance them like that. It, um, it looks like this. It's just a circle. And you, you, know, you put a little plus sign in it, and you color one corner and color the other the opposite corner and that's the center of mass symbol and uh, here's what it, it turns out um, you know to be where the center of mass is located well if we're going to locate this balancing point the center of mass somewhere well we need an origin and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the XY axis like this and um, so this will be my x-axis. And in a way, it's kind of like thinking about where is the average location of mass? I mean, that's one way to think about what the center of mass is. Where is that average location of mass? And so, well, here's, uh, you know, here's what we do. We say uh, the position of the center of mass on the x-axis. So we'll abbreviate that x sub cm. Well, what we're going to do is we are going to um, multiply. We're going to say this is, uh, this is x2 and this is x1. And what we want is xcm, the location of this guy. Uh, and what we do is to find the average location of the mass, we say uh, m1 x1 plus m2 x2 so we're going to we're going to take x1 and multiply it by m1 we take x2 and multiply that by m2 and then we div divide by the total mass of the system m1 plus m2 okay well that's great now, what if I, uh, so this, this will tell me where the, uh, and we're actually going to do a little uh, lab, ooh, a lab, on, uh, on Thursday where we're going to show that this actually works. It really does work. So we're going to see empirically that it works. And then when we get to torque, we can really kind of prove that it works. But um, for right now, this will be good enough. Now, what, what would happen if on, on my, uh, for my system, um, Oh, oh, one thing that's kind of interesting, if these were planets, like if this was Pluto and this is its moon, actually Pluto has a, a moon that's very large compared to its own size. 
and they orbit around their center of mass. Okay, where you know where uh, does you know if if, if these are two uh, planets or two stars, maybe a double star system, a binary star system, where where do they orbit? They don't you know the the light one doesn't orbit the heavy one. They both orbit the center, the location of the center of mass. So that's one application of the center of mass. Yeah. Is Pluto, is Pluto a planet again? Um, it's a dwarf planet. Pluto is whatever Pluto is. I, I don't you know how we la how we humans choose to label it is is uh, irrelevant. Um, but it, it's it's a dwarf planet, and it, it, there is a reason to distinguish it from the bigger planets. But I'm not going to get into that right now. Um, now also, um, so if you have a, um, a system of particles, what if I had more than one particle lined up here? What if I had, you know, a, a little particle right here? I'll call this, you know, here's X3, this is M3. And then I'll put a big, you know, maybe a bigger particle out here. Now this will move where I would actually put my center of mass, M4, X4. Well, I'm just going to continue uh, this, I would just put M3X3 plus M4X4. I just keep going. Plus M3 plus M4 plus dot, dot, dot. However many particles I line up here on the x-axis, I can find that balancing point. Okay, plus dot, 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 plus, am I still on screen? Yes. M and x to the n. Of course, uh, and, and this will give me my location of the uh, center of mass. Okay. Well, this is kind of awkward to write down, so we use uh, summation notation to make it a little bit easier. And so this is going to be um, the summation of mi, oops, and my xi and just to be you know usually we neglect this but i equals 1 to n where n is the number of particles and then I'm just going to divide it by now I, I can say the summation of all the masses I'll go ahead and do that summation of mi i equals 1 to n but what we normally do and what, what, what's done in the textbook is we say, look, just, just call this the total mass. So now when I do this, I kind of just drop all these indexes and just say, hey, let's sum up all mixi. We're just going to add all these together and divide it by the total mass. So I make capital M the total mass of the system. Now. I can as easily, uh, ex you know, do this on the y-axis. I can say, oh well, whoops. I can say, well, uh, y, the location of the center of mass along the y-axis. Now, in my example that I've drawn here, it would be zero. None of these have, all of these have a position of y equals zero. But if I didn't. Um, if, you know, if I line them up along the y-axis, I can just sum all the masses. Why am I keep I keep doing that? Done it. I just say, okay, it's just y over the total mass, and of course I can say I can do this in three dimensions. Over the total mass, so you just do the same thing but in the y direction and the z direction and you can find the location of the center of mass um, of an object quite easily by using these equations they're very easy to do you know, for example um, what, uh, let's just stick with two dimensions because I'm drawing this on a piece of paper if I have an x-axis and a y-axis and I put my particles I'll just stick with four. You know, so here's four particles. 
Okay, and um, you know, just M1, M2, M3, and M4. Well, these position vectors have, for each of these guys, you know, they all have a position vector. So what I can do now is I can say, well, where is the center of mass? Well, it looks like it would be in here somewhere, doesn't it? Like they would all kind of balance right in there. Uh, that's just by eyeballing it. But if you want to calculate it exactly, <clears throat> you would just say, well, R center of mass is equal to X center of mass in the I hat direction plus Y center of mass in the J hat direction. Okay, we'll just write it like that. And now you just apply, you know, this equation. You, you know, this, look at... Uh, R1, well, it has an X component and a Y component. So um, to figure out the uh, X, the X location of the center of mass, you just it's as if you just drop all of these down to the X axis and treat them like they're just on the X axis and use this equation here to find where that center of mass location would be on along the X axis. And then, of course, to find the, the, where the location of the center of mass is on the y-axis, you just kind of extend these particles over here and figure out where that location is there, and you've got it. No problem. It's a little tedious, but it's not very hard. Okay. Um, and... This is what you want to use, these equations for, for x, y, and z. These are, these are the equations you want to use to find the center of mass if you have an object, well, that's a system of particles or an object that can be modeled as a system of particles. Okay, now, here, for ex well, I mean, here I've got, I've actually just drawn these as particles. You know, all the mass is concentrated here here and here. Now let me show you an example of something that's an extended body, that is it's it's not mass all concentrated at one point, but it's mass spread out over an area, but I can still treat it as if it's a system of particles. And this is the kind of like the lab we're going to do. Um, if I've got an object that looks like something like this, ah, let's just go across like that. A um, maybe this is a like a piece of sheet metal or something. And if you're a mechanical engineer and you're going to have a, a part in some machine and it's going to be rotating or it's going to be doing something, you're going you're going to want to know where the center of mass is. By the way, if you have a rotating piece of equipment and its center of mass is away from the axis of rotation. You're going to set up a vibration in your um, in your machine, and sometimes that's what you want. Like you know, a cell phone has a little vibrator in it. Okay, what what it has is it has a little piece of mass in it that's off center from the axis of rotation. So when it spins, it shakes the phone. But if you're designing a car, and you're going to have all these rotating objects in the car, you certainly don't want too much vibration in your car. It'll be uncomfortable. It'll wear the parts out and all, all that sort of thing. If, if you're uh, designing a jet engine where you're going to have all these rotating blades and so on, uh, you certainly don't want the center of mass to be off your axis of rotation because you could you know, shake the engine apart. So this is a very important consideration. I mean, this has a lot of practical applications. But if you've got something simple like this, well, where is that center of mass? Well, uh, what you can do is break this into rectangles and say, figure out what the mass of this whole thing is and say, where is the center of mass of a rectangle? Well, it's at its very center. And where is this? Well, it'll be right here. Now, this one's going to have a much bigger mass, but it's going to act as if it's all concentrated right there. And this is going to have another 
uh, a less, much less mass, and its center of mass is going to be located there. And now what you can do is you can treat it like a two-particle system. So here's, like if, if you make your origin out here somewhere, uh, now it looks like the center of mass, well where would it balance along the X? Just use your intuition. It'd probably be balanced somewhere around here, wouldn't it? And the center of mass uh, looks like it would be right about here. Well, now I'm just eyeballing this. So it looks like the center of mass will be, like for the whole thing, would be right about there. So, but, you know, eyeballing it's not good enough. You've got to figure it out. So what you've got to do is figure out how much mass this object has. You know, you can multiply its area mass density by its area, and you'll get its mass. Same thing here and then locate this and then here's you know here's r1 and here's r2 and then use and treat it like a like a particle system so that's one way to figure out the center of mass for an article for for an object that is either a system of particles like i started with <coughs> or an object that is uh, pretty easy to model as if it is a system of particles but what if I have a, an object that's not a uh, system of particles? What if I've got an object that looks like this, you know, a triangle? Well, maybe I've got a sheet metal part and it's a triangular, and I want to know where is its center of mass. Well, let's put its, here's the y-axis and here's the x-axis. Well, we can use our intuition. Here's the heavy end. It's probably going to be a little closer to the heavy end. And then over here, where would it balance over here? Well, a little bit closer to the heavy end on this side. So probably right around here somewhere is the center of mass of this object. Well. Um, okay, but we want to calculate it. Well, but here we can't really divide this up into a system of particles and, and do it. We have to figure it out uh, using calculus. And, and so what we have, let's take a look at this in terms of the x, um, the the location of the center of mass along the x-axis. Well, we said that this is the summation of xi mi over the total mass. Okay, well, you know, wh what do we do when we use calculus? We turn this summation of a discrete number of particles into the summation of an infinite number of infinitesimal particles. Or not necessarily particles, it can be, you know, lines or, or whatever. So in other words, we turn this into integration. So what we're going to say is this. We're going to go one over the total mass times the summation of. Now think about what I'm probably going to do. I'm probably going to, I'm going to divide this up into a little rectangle. I'll have a little dx right there. Okay, and, um, and, it, and this little, little guy here is going to have uh, a certain mass. Okay, and so what we do, and well, and it's also, well, it's going to have a location in space. Let's keep this three-dimensional for a second. Well, it, it is, oh, I'm sorry, I, I kind of messed that up. It is going to have a dx. We are going to turn it into dx. Let, let's take a look at this little guy right here. If I want the overall center of mass. Well, it's going to be right in here, isn't it? So here's my r. And it's going to have a little bit of center of mass. I, you know what? I'm not going to use this rectangle. Let me go to a blob. Here's, here's the blob, okay? 
And what if I want to know what the center of mass of the blob is? Thank you. Zane, that's for you. Well, let's say the center of mass is like right about here. Well, what am I going to do? We said the R center of mass. What we're going to do is we're going to pick a little tiny chunk of mass right here. I'm going to call that little tiny chunk of mass, little tiny piece of mass, dm. It's the tiniest part of this thing that I can think of. It's the size of a particle. And it has a tiny infinitesimal mass. And here's its location in space. So there's r. So the center of mass is going to be 1 over the total mass of this whole thing times the integral of r dm. OK. Now this, this is the basic equation, the most basic, most general equation for finding the center of mass. Look, I mean, it's for in three dimensions. It's just this. But it's really impossible to integrate, OK, because and why is it impossible to integrate? Well, this is r. Um, which is a displacement, or actually a position from the origin. It's a position vector. And what is this? This is mass. It's something that's totally different. And you cannot integrate with different variables. You have to integrate with the same variables. So in other words, I have to turn this in terms of mass, or I have to turn this into terms of you know length or position or whatever. Well, that's what we're going to do. We're going to turn this mass into terms of this length so I can actually do the integration. So, well, how do I do that? Okay, well, I'm going to talk about density. Let's talk about density. I've got room over here. Let's talk about density. Now, we have what's called, uh, now, the, the, you've dealt with density before in chemistry, right? What's the density of lead or something? It's like, I don't know, 13 grams per cubic centimeter, something like that. I don't know if that's lead or not. But gold, it's like the heaviest or the most dense. But um, at least that's what I think. I don't know. But that's, a that's called a volume density. And, and, and what it is, and the letter we use to represent a volume density is rho. Now, you've used the letter capital D before, I think, like in eighth grade or something, or even in chemistry. I don't know if you use rho or if you use capital D. I don't, maybe you didn't even talk about density in chemistry. I don't remember. But, and what does this mean? It means the mass per unit volume. So you just take the mass, divide it by the volume. So you get kilograms per cubic meter. Those are the units we're going to end up with for that kind of density. Then we have what's called an area density. And we're going to use the letter sigma to represent an area density. Now pay attention to these. We're going to use rho sigma and lambda here in a second. We're going to use this not only in mechanics when we're talking about mass densities, but hey, in a couple of months, we're going to be talking about charge densities, how a net charge is um, spread out over a volume or over a surface area or over a line. And we're going to use these variables, rho, sigma, and, and lambda, to represent that. So you really need to pay attention. This is important stuff. So this is the amount of mass you get per unit area. Now this is uh, what you want to use for like a sheet metal part or uh, like plywood. Um, you wouldn't want to use a volume uh, density for, for that. You'd want an area uh, density for like a piece of sheet metal or plywood or something. How much mass does, you know, per square foot or per, per square meter? And that's what we use here. We use kilograms per square meter and we use the sigma for it. Then we have what's called a linear density, 
which is lambda. And this is the mass per unit length. And this one you might like, if you're, you're going to use a big long piece of PVC pipe and you want to know how much mass is going to take, well, how much length of pipe do you need? And you find, you look up how much does, you know, how, how much mass does this pipe have per unit length, right? Or like a, a two by four. Sure, a two by four has a volume density, but that would be silly. Um, an, an area density, sure, it has an area density, but that would be silly to use that. But a linear density, like how much does, you know, a two by four weigh, or how much mass does it have per unit length? That makes sense. How many, you know, how many, how many feet of of two by fours do I need, and how heavy is that going to be? You look up the linear mass density for that. So this is kilograms per unit length. Here is 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 a is a meter. So we're going to use these densities right now. We're going to use this idea of density to turn this little mass guy right here into um, a um, into something that I can actually uh, use that I can use to uh, to integrate. Okay. Now uh, let, let me take a look here. What's the what's the assignment again? Um, uh, example 13 and 14. I'll tell you what. I'm going to do your homework for you right now. Whoa. Yeah. Well, I'm going to do the, the examples that are in the book to show you how to, how to use these ideas of density uh, in that to an integration to find the center of mass for uh, extended objects. Okay. So let's, um, let's do example... Uh, this example, I, I think example 13 is easy, so I'm just going to skip it. Let's go to example 14. And this is on page 273 of your book. And here's what it says. It says, uh, show that the center of mass of a rod of mass m and length l lies midway between its ends, assuming the rod has a uniform mass per unit length. So we're going to start off with something. We're going to use calculus to do it, but it's one of these nice problems that you already know what the answer is. So we can. So the point here is to see how to use the calculus to figure it out. So here's what's given. Um, we've got a. We've got a, a linear a rod right here. And we're going to put the end of the rod at the origin here. And this will be the x-axis. And we're going to say that this has a total mass of m. Okay, And it has a length of l. And uh, so what we want, and we're going to say that it's a uniform rod. This, the density of this thing isn't changing with length. It's, it's just all uniform, all nice. And what we want to find is the center of mass. <coughs> now, we know where this is going to be, right? You know it's going to be L over 2. Doesn't that make sense? It's going to be at L over 2. If I stick my finger right here, I'm going to balance, balance that stick right at this, you know, right there. All right. Well, but, you know, it's not good enough to say, well, I know it's going to be there. We have to show it. So let's use the, um, well, let's start off with the most basic equation because I like to do that. Okay, so this is the most general. Now, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to say, look, all of this is along the x-axis. The y-axis and the z-axis are irrelevant to this problem. So I'm just going to say, change this. OK. Now, I can't integrate this. Well, first of all, just going from here to here makes sense to everybody? Right? All I did is say, all right, look, we're just looking at x. 
Okay, so I can't integrate this because this is mass and this is, you know, position, and I, I can't integrate things that have different variables. So I have to get, I have to turn this into this. Well, let's take a look. I know I'm going to want a dx, right? Well, let's look at a little chunk of dx right here. Now, I can't draw an infinitesimal, so I cheat a little bit. It's really a delta x, but I pretend like it's a dx. So there's my little thing. There's my little dx. Now, what I want is I want the mass of this dx. And here's how I do it. Okay, I look at my density. I'm going to say that dx, now really focus right now because you're going to use this over and over again, this semester and next semester. This is a big deal. dx in terms of, um, oh, I'm sorry. dm is going to be equal to lambda times dx. Okay, now write that down. And then now let's think. What does lambda represent? It, it, yeah. okay. it represents the mass per unit length. This represents how much length you have. So what you get when you go mass per unit length times the length, well, of course, this length is infinitesimal. So you get an infinitesimal amount of mass. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? Are you good? Okay. So mass per unit length times a little tiny bit of length Gives me a little tiny bit of mass. That's what this means. Well, what is lambda here, though? What is the mass per unit length of this stick? Well, it gives me the mass, and it gives me the length, and it tells me that, the, that it's uniform, that it's not changing with length. So I can say this. Lambda, the is just equal to the total mass divided by the total length. It's a constant. The linear mass density is constant. If this is like two kilograms per meter over here, it's two kilograms per meter over here, it's two, it's two kilograms per meter, the whole length of the stick. You with me? Okay, and the way you figure it out is like the total mass divided by the total length. Now, when you calculated volume densities in, in eighth grade, what did you do? You measured the volume of something, and then you measured its mass, and then you divided its mass by its volume. Now, you, you may get a problem where the density is not a constant. But they'll have to give you a density that is a function of the length. And then you just, so if this was a function of x, if the density was a function of x, you would just include that function of x, dx, and then you substitute it in there, and now you, you're able to integrate. But in this case, it's just a constant. So now I can rewrite my equation for the center of mass. 1 over the mass, the integral of x, but dm now is lambda dx, which is m over l times dx. Now you can do this now. You can do this integral now. First of all, what goes away? The mass of the stick. The mass of the stick doesn't matter. If this was a uniform piece of balsa wood, or if this was a big lead pipe, it wouldn't matter. The center of mass would be in the same place. The mass cancels out. The length does matter. So the length is going to come out. Now, um, I need to put in my, now that my I'm dealing with dx right here, where does x start and where does x end? Look at the picture. Where does x start? 
my little dx's start at x equals zero. And I'm going to do this until I get to x equals L. L. We're going to go from zero to L. So let's, let's clean this up before I actually do the integration. Uh, equals one over L times x dx from zero to L. Okay, well, what have I got? I've got one over L, x times x is x squared over two from zero to L. So I'm just gonna put an L in there. If I put a zero in there, I get zero. So x to the center of mass is equal to one over L. Put in the L, we get L squared over two. The L cancels the L squared. And I get the obvious answer, L over two. We knew that ahead of time, but I want you to see that after one, two, three, four, five, six lines of math, okay, we actually get what we knew was true to begin with. Obviously, there are problems where your intuition is, you know, going to be harder to, to, you know, to confirm. Uh, sometimes you just need to do the math. You know, do the math, save the world. Okay. All right. Now, this was uh, example 14 in your book. Now let's do example 15. So here is example 15. It's on page 274. And uh, whoops. And and so um, here's what we're going to do. Uh, well, it says you um, you have been asked to hang a metal sign from a single vertical wire. The sign has the triangular shape shown in the figure. The bottom of the sign is to be parallel to the ground. At what distance from the left end of the sign should you attach the support wire? Okay, so JJ's cheese shop, I guess, is what it says. So here's what's given. Given a triangle. This is kind of where I tried to start, but... And what I want to do, I want this to be parallel to the ground. I want to hang this. Now, where do you think the center of mass is in here, just using your intuition? Right about in there. Number triangles is the center of mass, one of those center thingies, like the, the uh, what do you call it, like the centroid or the, one of those other ones. Like, you know, like you take the line that's all the angle bisectors and where they all intersect at one point. Who? Or like the, the length bisectors and they all intersect I, I have to point. say, I, that's, a, that's a really great question and I don't, I don't know. I don't know. It's the length bisector. It is? That's the center of mass of the triangle. It'll balance? If you, oh. oh, that's cool. Well, maybe that's a better way to do it. I don't know. Um, but if you hung the sign by a wire clip, wouldn't that have to spin around? Yeah, it, it's a stupid idea. You wouldn't want it. This is not. But so so yeah. So what you want to do is hang this by a, a line. Yeah. So yeah. So th this is not a good idea. Um, now let's just uh, put some arbitrary uh, values on here. We're going to say this has a length of a. So we're keeping this all very general. And this will be b. And I want to know where is the center of mass along the x direction here. Now, first thing I'm going to do is create an axis system. Here's my y. Here's x. Here's my y-axis here. And uh, what I want to find is I want to find uh, the center of mass of x. Given this. Well, let's solve it. 
Well, R, the center of mass, is equal to R times D. Okay, no, let, let, let's take one other thing. This is given, another thing we know is we have to be given the total mass of this thing. All right, we have to know, hey, I'm just going to say this thing has a mass of M. I'm also going to say that it has a uniform mass area density. This is like sheet metal or plywood or something. The, a little chunk of mass over here, you know, if I cut out a square inch over here, a square inch over here, I'll have the same mass. It's like varying with, you know, position. So uniform area density. Um, and so the first thing I'm going to do, well, I want to find XCM. So I'm going to go, oh, I forgot the one over the total mass. One over the total mass, which is given times X DM, which, which is, this is what we did before. Well, All right, so um, I got to get rid of this uh, DM here, right? I got to get it in terms of X. So what I'm going to do, I, I know I'm going to want a DX, so I'm going to prick a little rectangle in here. And that has an area. Okay, and so what I need to do is figure out what the area of this guy is. And, um, and then multiply it by the area density. Well, let's figure out what the area uh, density is, uh, sigma. Well, it's the total area, I mean total mass divided by the total area. So what's the total mass divided by the total area? Well, what's the area of a, tr of a triangle? One half the base times the height. So this is going to be 2m over ab. OK, now dm, therefore, is going to be equal to 2m over ab times this area right here. Now let's figure, this has a width of dx. But what is its height? Well, we could say, well, it has a height of y. OK. But this is bad, because now I've introduced a new variable. And when I, if I substitute this in for dm, it ain't going to work. But can I, get, can I get y in terms of x? Sure, I can, because this is a straight line. And if I say, um, you know, y equals mx plus b, well, b here is, means the y-intercept, which is 0. But what is the slope here? b over a times x. So now I can take this and plug it in there. And now I've got my expression for dm. dm is going to be equal to the area density times the area of my infinitesimal, which is b over a times x. OK, so that's my y times dx. So this is more complicated. And by the way, this is where the, this class can help you if you're in AP Calc, because you will get problems like this in AP Calc. And, um, you know, so anyway, so this I'm now going to substitute in uh, there. And so I can, and I can solve the problem now. X CM is equal to 1 over the total mass times 
x times dm, but dm is 2m. Oh, what happens to the b here? Looks like the b cancels out. And uh, I'm going to get 2m over a squared. Right, a times a is a squared. You have an x, and then you have a dx. Now, where does x start and where does x end? x starts at 0 and ends at a. 0 to a. And this looks worse than it is. Notice the mass doesn't matter. It cancels out. So let's pull out all the constant stuff. I've got a 2 and an a squared. And then I've got an x squared. And I've got a dx from 0 to a. Zoom out a little bit. Um, so let's just evaluate this. I've got 2a squared. x squared times dx is x cubed. But you got to put it over 3. And we're going to go from 0 to a. Now when a is 0, this whole thing goes away. So all I really need to do is plug in the a for the x. And this becomes 2a squared times a cubed over 3. But wonderful things happen here. The a squared cancels the a cubed. And I've got 2 thirds of a. So x cm equals 2 thirds times a. And that's my answer. Now, let's take a look at that answer and see if it makes sense. Here's, from here to here is A, and it says my center of mass is going to be 2 thirds the way over. Doesn't that make intuitive sense? You're going to have to be closer to the heavy side. Well, it, it turns out that you're one, one third away from the heavy side or 2 thirds away from the lighter side of a triangle, and it will balance right there. So, so let me. So this is the whole thing here, the whole center of mass expression, or I mean the whole center of mass process when you're using integration. Um, this actual problem is about as hard as it gets, as as we're going to get in here. The only thing that might uh, throw you for a little bit of a loop is that if they give you an expression for the density. Like uh, here, uh, we found uh, this expression for the density. But there are some problems where they'll just give you a function. Like the, the uh, mass density is a function of x. Now, that seems harder, but it's actually easier than what we just did. That you, just, you just plug that in. That you just plug that, that density function into your expression for dm and integrate okay and you know the integral you'll end up with is going to be something that's easy to integrate you know just use the power rule no fancy tricks yes so we um multiplied by y for the dm so it's um what is that sigma dx y on this one but not on the rod one because the the height is uniform on the rod right it all came from our 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 uh, area element. See, here's our area. It has a width of dx, but it has a height of y. Okay. See that? I mean, it was a, a rectangle. The other one just had a width of dx, and we were multiplying it by a, a, a linear density. So dm was just that length, dx, times, times the linear mass density. Okay. okay. All right, there you go. The whole bloody thing. All right. Good luck.